Dear friends, I have a great honor and pleasure to moderate the lecture of Professor Ernst van Alpen. Alfen, sorry. Uh, Ernst van Alpen is a professor of literary studies uh, at Leiden University since the year 2000. Before he came to Leiden, he worked at University of Utrecht and Nijmegen. He was appointed as, a, as Queen Beatrice Professor of Dutch Studies, uh, as well as Professor of Rhetoric uh, at the University of California in Berkeley. He visited uh, Poland and cooperated uh, many times with the Polish University, especially with the Jagiellonian in Krakow. Uh, Professor van Alp Alphen uh, is interested in issues, as he said, of modern and postmodern literature and in the relation between literature and the visual arts. Parallelly, he is interested in problems related to trauma and memory and their role in uh, literary and artistic representation. His research was initially concentrated on Holocaust, but now, as we can see, his interests are much wider and they concern the topics that our network, the European Network Remembrance and Solidarity, is vitally interested in. He published many monographs, let me mention a few titles, uh, Staging the Archive, Art and Photography in Times of New Media, Art in Mind, the Contribution of Contemporary Images, uh, images to, uh, to Thought, Shadow and Play, the Living, Historicizing and Representing the Holocaust, Armando, Shaping Memory, uh, or caught by history, Holocaust effects in contemporary art, literature, and theory. And one of the first, Francis Bacon uh, and the loss of self. His theme for today is uh, legacies of Stalinism and the Gulag, and, and the Gulag manifestations of trauma and post-memory. Uh, Professor Van Alphen, thank you for coming to our conference. The floor is yours. Uh, yes. I'm already a little bit anxious that I will run out of time, so uh, I will begin immediately. Uh, Jevgenia Ginsburg, daughter of a Jewish family of pharmacists, studied uh, social sciences and pedagogy. She married the mayor of uh, Kazan and became a member of the Communist Party. In 1937, she and her husband were thrown out of the Communist Party because they were supposed to have contacts with the Trotskists. In July of the same year, she was arrested and convicted to 10 years of forced labor and her husband uh, to 15 years. They made a long odyssey along several prisons, work camps, and places of exile, among which the women's camp al Shir uh, near Karaganda. In 1949, she was released, although she had to stay in the Siberian Magadan zone. In 1950, she was arrested again, uh, bent to uh, Kolima, and only in 1953, after Stalin's death, uh, she was allowed to return to Moscow. In 1955, she was uh, rehabilitated. Um, back in Moscow, she wrote her memoirs, uh, Journey into the Whirlwind, at first not published in Russia, but abroad. There, uh, they became uh, as famous as the work of Mandelstam, describing in the most impressive way the horrors of the Stalin era. The most absurd feelings have torn me, she writes, but the most important one was amazement. Something like that was not thinkable. Something like that could not happen. 
One of her two sons, uh, Vasily uh, Aksinonov, also became a well-known writer. Exiled to the United States, he wrote Generations of Winter. This is a panoramic novel describing Soviet life from 1925 to 1945. It is seen um, as the war and peace of the 20th century. Although both mother and son uh, represent in their works Soviet life under Stalin, the genres they use for it are strikingly different. The mother writes her memoirs, the son writes a novel, which is fictional, but anchored in recent historical reality. The novel has nothing of a testimony or a memoir of the second generation, the child of a victim of Stalinism. His style of writing is far from realistic. It has been characterized as headlong, ruminative, as well as wildly surreal. In the narrative, uh, animals, trees, and birds interact with human beings. Although the horrors of Siberian exile are also represented at length, it is never clear if the testimonial stories of his mother play any role in this uh, novel. I am using this example of Ginsburg and uh, Aksinonov, a mother and a son who both are writers, because in this talk I will deal with the dynamics between the first generation of survivors, in this case of the Gulag, and the second or later generations, in other words, the generation of children or grandchildren of those survivors. In the context of another apocalyptic uh, past, namely the Holocaust, one speaks usually of a dynamics uh, between the different generations that consist of transmission of trauma, also called post-memory. In the case of Ginsburg and Aksinonov, it is, however, unclear that one can speak of a transmission of trauma or post-memory. Although they both deal with the past of Stalinist error, uh, terror, it is not at all obvious that the account of uh, Aksinonov is in any way determined by the traumatic history of his mother. It is as if he writes as an exiled Russian citizen using his imagination and not as the son of a mother who suffered herself all possible terror of the Stalinist regime. Although his imaginative novels can be understood as the uh, result of the desire to bridge the gap between him and the life of his mother in the Gulag, this desire is only expressed indirectly, never up front. In order to better understand this dynamic between first and later generations, I will first explore the concept of trauma, of the transmission of trauma and of post-memory as they have been developed and used in Holocaust studies. But although the Holocaust as well as the Gulag have both been apocalyptic events in European and Russian history, uh, there are also many differences between the two. We first have to understand how these events differ before we can understand the dynamics between first and later generations of the Holocaust as well as of the Gulag. Alexander Atkind has adequately pointed out the main differences between the Nazi regime and its most notorious practice, the Holocaust, and the Stalinist regime in Russia and the Gulag. First of all, the Stalinist regime in Russia lasted much longer than the Nazi regime in Germany. Whereas the Holocaust lasted five years, the terror of the Gulag lasted at least three decades. In addition, the Soviet regime lasted for seven uh, uh, decades and Russia is less distant from the collapse of its Soviet state than Germany is from the collapse of uh, its Nazi state. According to Atkins, this difference implies that the concept of generation is less useful in the case of Russia and the Gulag than in the studies of Holocaust survivors and their offspring. A second important difference concerns the distinction between victims and executioners or perpetrators. In the case of Nazism, this distinction is clear and absolute. Who the victims were is clearly defined. First of all, Jews, but also Romas, homosexuals, and political enemies. The Soviet victims, however, were significantly more diverse than the Nazi victims. Their descendants are more dispersed and have competing interests, which creates multiple memory conflicts in the post-Soviet Union. Not only are the victims more diverse, the distinction between executioner and per or perpetrator and victim was not stable. Someone who had been an executioner or perpetrator for a long time could suddenly become a victim, he, him or her, he, herself. These roles or subject positions were to a certain extent flexible, 
And Stalinism made different kinds of victims. Not only those who were sent to the Gulag were victims of Stalinism, also those who were forced to migrate from Western Russia to the East can be considered as victims of Stalinism. A third difference concerns the later generations. The descendants or later generations do not share or recognize the concepts that were used by the perpetrators to victimize their parents or grandparents. Notions like the gulags, saboteurs, the bourgeoisie, social parasites, anti-Soviet elements, class enemies have no meaning to them. These notions do not enable later generations to feel compassion or empathy with uh, the generation of their parents. It is usually the opposite. They feel shame or are bewildered because of the strange accusations of their older relatives. It alienates them from them. In the case of the descendants of Holocaust victims or survivors, it is exactly the opposite. Even those who had so far not ident identified as Jewish, the past of their parents or grandparents has made them Jewish through identification with them. A fourth difference concerns the end of the Nazi regime and of the Soviet Union, re respectively. Germany's post-war transformation was forced upon it by military defeat and occupation. Russia's post-Soviet transformation was instead a political choice. These four differences have great repercussions for the aftermath of Stalinism. In Russia, there is nothing like a full list of victims of the, or of the executioners, nor are there any adequate authoritative memorials, museums, or monuments which could stabilize the understanding of these events for generations to come. There's more to say about the identity of the victims of Nazism and Stalinism, however. As Atkin points out, the Nazi theory um, of racial purity was implemented with consistency. The application of the Soviet theory of class warfare, warfare was more arbitrary. Although this is not true for the assimilated Jews from especially Germany itself, most of the Jews and Romas who died in the Nazi camps agreed with their jailers that they were Jews or Romas, though, of course, they did not agree that this should be cause to kill them. Um, I quote, in contrast, most of those kulaks, saboteurs, and enemies of the people who died in the Soviet camps disagreed with their jailers that they were kulaks, saboteurs, and enemies of the people. Some, some of them hated enemies of the people just as much as their jailers did. In the Stalinist camps, many political prisoners shared the principles of their perpetrators, but clung to the belief that in their personal cases, they had been mistakenly identified. In the Nazi camps, the victims objected uh, to, uh, to the reasons for his or her persecution, but not to his or her identification as Jew, Gypsy, political enemy, or homosexual. After having pointed out, uh, pointed out the differences between German Nazism and Stalinist communism, and between the Holocaust and the Gulag, Etkin comes up with the following conclusion. Uh, one thing is clear, the very nature of Soviet terror makes it difficult to comprehend, remember, and memorialize. Indeed, I share this conclusion. However, when he explains in his introduction the guiding concept for his whole book, namely mourning, he defines mourning and trauma in such an idiosyncratic way that the ramifications of the impossibility of comprehension, remembrance, and memorialization are getting blurred instead of disentangled. He distinguishes mourning from trauma a concept that is, according to him, close to, but different from trauma. And it's also on the slide. Trauma is re a response to a condition that had been experienced by the self. Mourning is a response to a condition of the other. In my understanding, trauma is a failed experience, an event or situation that could not be experienced by the self. It becomes a trauma when the symbolic order does not offer concepts in terms of which the event can be understood. And mourning is not a response to a condition of the other, but a condition of the self. Mourning is the response to the loss of the other, but this loss happens to the self. It is the self that loses the other. It is with this different notion of trauma and mourning that I will revisit the issue that the Soviet terror 
made it difficult to comprehend, to remember, and to memorialize. The amount of camp literature about the Gulag is extensive. Many survivors of the Gulag have written down what happened to them, how they ended up in the Gulag, how they survived it, and what life was uh, like after they had returned. In this respect, the Gulag seems not to be different from the Holocaust. Both apocalyptic events have resulted in memoirs and testimonies of those events. The genres used to convey the experiences of the survivors are historical, memoirs, autobiography, testimony. Although the number of testimonial texts about the Gulag, as well as of the Holocaust, is extensive, within those texts the unrepresentability of what is paradoxically being represented is a returning issue. Now, this is how we must understand um, Ginsburg Ter's statement in her memoirs Journey into the Whirlwind. Uh, something like that was not thinkable. Something like that could not happen. Her bewildered assertion is emblematic for how trauma comes about. Events that happen to a subject cannot be understood, grasped or experienced. As a consequence, the inexperienced events stay with the subject and are reenacted in unmediated form as trauma. Still, there is an important difference between the many memoirs that came out of the Holocaust and those in which the Gulag resulted. As indicated in the Oxford Russian Life History Archive, the history of the Russian Revolution was strictly controlled by the Party History Committee. Uh, I quote, personal history in the sense of autobiography has a strictly defined role. Loyal citizens of the Soviet state were supposed to recite their lives. Life histories were also collected in order to buttress the official ideology of the Soviet state. In later decades of Soviet history, much testimony relating to experience of the Second World War was also collected. However, this process of orchestrated collecting of testimony was highly selective. It marginalized testimonies that recovered practices, processes, and inner experiences rather than events. Ordinary Soviet people learned to think of life writing or life narrating in certain constrained contexts. There is enough reason to assume that the Gulag has been as traumatic as the Holocaust. Of course, this assertion is speculative because based on a theoretical argument. Let me explain the ratio of this argument. The cause of the difficulty of telling the past of the Gulag should not be located in the extremity of the event itself, but rather in the process and mechanisms um, uh, of representation. The stalling of the discursive process implies that the problem of the unrepresentability of the Gulag has already arisen during the Gulag itself and not afterwards when survivors try to provide testimonies of it, literary, artistic or not. Or to put it differently, the later representational problems are a continuation of the impossibility during the event itself to experience the Gulag in terms of the symbolic order then available. Having said this, I immediately have to be more specific, because I contend that in the case of the Gulag, not only the first-hand experiences of the Gulag have been traumatic, but especially the experience in the second degree, those of the second generation. Let me explain this. As pointed out earlier, in the Stalinist camps, many so-called Gulags, saboteurs and enemies of the people hated the enemies of the people just as much as their jailers did. The plots or narrative frames which are available or which are inflicted are unacceptable because they do not do justice to the way in which one partakes in these events. This is clearly at stake in how most people who ended up in the Gulag experienced that what had, had happened to them. Many political prisoners shared the principles of their perpetrators but clung to the belief that in their personal cases they had been mistakenly identified. They had been condemned as enemies of the people, whereas so far they had completely or largely identified with the politics and ideology of the Communist Party. The outcome of events is clearly unacceptable and beyond con comprehension, because not in line with their political convictions, convictions or behavior. 
loyal communists who ended up as enemy of the people, this is, uh, this is not acceptable as employment, especially when it is not proven that they have done anything against the party politics. This made the ordeal of having been sent to the Gulag unnarratable. For according to the official inflicted employment, misbehavior or wrong ideas were the reason for being sent to the Gulag. This would imply that surviving the Gulag should not be told by means of the genre of testimony or memoir, but by means of confession. However, not only the imposed employment of having been transformed into an enemy of the people is unacceptable, but also the genre through which this employment is supposed to be conveyed, eh? not testimony, but confession. The prevalent emotion that is produced by this imposed employment and genre of confession is shame. In great contrast with the Holocaust, the emotion that is prevalent in memories and post-memories of the Gulag is shame, not mourning. And in that respect, I do not agree with uh, Alexander Atkin. But how should we understand this affect of shame? Shame is not a result of prohibition nor of repression. It is not the product of uh, internalized intra-psychic structure or mechanism. Instead, shame is the result of an interrelational structure. It is a disruptive moment in a circuit of identity constructing and identificatory communication with another person. Shame occurs when an expectation is not met and the communication fails. We can say that the Stalinist executioners of the Gulag did not meet the expectations of those who became prisoners of the Gulag. Communication between fellow communists failed. The Stalinist people in power refused to play their part in the continuation of mutual gazes. The fallen face with eyes down and head averted as main symptom of shame was the result. Shame is, however, not only produced in failed communication between the Stalinists and the so-called enemies of the people sent by them to the Gulag. The social isolation of the prisoners of the camps repeats itself after they had survived the Gulag and come home. Their children and other relatives are often not able or willing to mirror themselves in the expressions of the first generation survivors of the Gulag. Being embarrassed by their, their ordeal, the second generation is not able to play its part in the continuation of mutual cases. The second generation is not able to give the feedback the first generation needs in order to reconstruct their identity after survival. The second generation is not able to do so because they cannot mirror themselves in the gaze of people who were accused of being enemies of the people. So there is no easy continuation between first and second generation. That relation is undermined and broken up by multiple productions of shame. This relationship between first and second generation is radically affected by shame. This is almost the complete opposite of the relationship between first and second generation survivors of the Holocaust. Although the second generation experience uh, experiences an absolute gap between their world and the pre-Holocaust world of their parents, the desire to bridge that gap compels a strong identification with the parents, which succeeds in bridging that gap. In the case of the Gulag, shame on the, on the side of second generation, as well as first generation, makes such identification and the bridged gap as a result impossible. If the most important affect that determines the dynamic between first and generation is shame instead of mourning, the notion of post-memory cannot easily be used in order to assess the dynamic. Again, I will first describe this, this, uh, this dynamic in case of first and second generation survivors of the Holocaust, for it is in that context that this dynamic between generation has been the topic of discussion from a clinical perspective, but also from a cultural perspective more broadly. It is also in that context that the notion of post-memory has been proposed and developed. Since the 1980s, uh, the second generation, or sometimes even the third generation, has become an important notion in reflections about the remembrance and the legacy of the Holocaust. The expression ref, uh, refers, uh, first of all, to the children and grandchildren 
of those who survived the Holocaust, but it is also used in a more general way, not implying a familial relation, but what Marianne Hears calls an affili uh, affiliative relation. When we start using the term second generation for the children uh, of Holocaust survivors, it seems to imply that they are also, in one way or another, both victims and survivors of the Holocaust. The term does not imply that the second generation is a completely new generation, one that differs fundamentally from the generation of their parents. On the contrary, the phrase seems to suggest a fundamental continuity between first and second generation. One might expect the experiences and memoirs of the Holocaust survivors and of their children to be fundamentally different, but the expression second generation seems to bridge that divide and to introduce the idea of continuity between the generations. I wish to question the possibility and the nature of that continuity. Something real is clearly at stake with the second uh, or later generations. Simply put, according to many, the effects of the Holocaust on those who survived it have been transmitted to their children. They often suffer from clinical symptoms that can or should be understood in terms of their parents' Holocaust trauma. Two early scholarly texts on the subject question the idea that victimhood is transmitted from the first to the second generation. These texts uh, can be seen as founding texts to the extent that they have been established uh, this special attention for the generation after. I'm referring to Helen Epstein's Children of the Holocaust, Conversations with Sons and Daughters of Survivors, and Nadine Fresco's essay, Remembering the Unknown. It is important to notice that these two founding texts by Epstein and Fresco assess the dynamic between survivors of the Holocaust and their children as one which utterly fails to establish continuity between generations. According to them, precisely this failure causes the intense desire for it on the side of the children. The idea of intergenerational transmission of trauma implies a fundam fundamental continuity between generations. The dynamics between children and survivor parents is rather def uh, defined by disconnection, has discontinuity. However, disconnection is not an emotional, uh, disconnection not in an emotional personal sense, but in terms of intelligibility. But I would even say that the more children feel disconnected from the past of their survivor parents, the less they are able to know it or understand it, the deeper they feel personally connected to them or the more they need, they need that connection. This results in a strong identification of the second generation with the first generation, the survivors of the Holocaust. It is through this strong identification that the second generation is able to bridge the fundamental discontinuity that defines the relationship between the generations. How does this assessment of the dynamic between first and generation Holocaust survivors compare to the legacies of Stalinism and the dynamics between first and ge uh, second generation survivors of the Gulag? My expertise in Russian literature and culture is limited, but still, the following is the uh, impression I have. The literature of the first generation, the so-called camp literature, seems vast. And like the literature of the first generation Holocaust uh, literature, this literature is testimonial. Camp literature consists mainly of memoirs and autobiography. The expressions of the second generation uh, are, however, rather different from the expressions of the Holocaust second generation. They are different because the affects that determine the second and later generation's relation to the past of the first generation are different and highly ambivalent. The affects that are most prominent are not mourning, but suspicion, shame, and nostalgia. And sometimes all three occur at the same time. Later generations are literally not able to face the past of the earlier generation, to look them into their eyes, whereas shame and suspicion defines the way the generation directly after the first one relates to the first generation. Later generations are less defined uh, by shame than by nostalgia to the period that victimized the first generation. Different as shame and nostalgia may be, 
they have in common that both affects avoid a direct facing of the first generation. But these affects are not expressed directly by means of testimonial genres. They are often expressed by genres that belong to the fantastic. Ghosts and zombies figure as the indirect expressions of how later generations look back with anxiety as well as desire to the past of earlier generations, uh, to the past of earlier generations still part of the Stalinist era. Area. The past is not, not directly identified in the traumatic past of first generation survivors, but returns indirectly in the shape of ghosts and zombies. The novel Justification by Dimitri Bikov, published in 2005, can illustrate this point. The novel tells the history of the Stalinist era in unexpected ways. An important role was reserved for the resurrection or return of the victims of Stalinist terror. Their return is part of a vision of Russia's historical vision and of post-Soviet identity. An important role is played by a black lake. This lake is accessible to someone called Kretok, an old neighbor uh, of the much younger protagonist Rogov. As Kretov claims, the lake has no bottom. The black lake clearly symbolizes a collective post-Soviet historical oblivion and confusion about the past. This past seems to resist comprehension because it is lost and shattered. The protagonist Rogov is a young historian who is obsessed with the political oppression under Stalin, and more particularly with the fate of his grandfather, who was arrested in 1938 and disappeared. Rogov is really puzzled by uh, why Stalin exterminated so many Russians. I quote, I don't understand though, maybe for the purpose of keeping up the fear or crushing the opposition, the arrests were truly necessary, but just not quite so many of them, not on this scale. I don't see the principle. I cannot see the criteria he used to exterminate. At this moment, still puzzled, he later comes up with the explanation. The repression, I quote, the repression acted as an immense filtering apparatus, and the few who bravely withstood torture and did not confess to the fabricated crimes brought up during interrogation were not shot or deported for the rec to the regular camps. They were medically treated and after their wounds healed, they were sent to special Siberian settlements where they became members of a new elite, a golden squadron of unbreakable people, many of them who assisted in defense of Stalingrad. Stalin's purges were a way of selecting the toughest people. The old man Kratok explains that this elaborate and cruel selection procedure was the only way to secure and preserve the Soviet Empire. The young Rogov initially does not believe Kratov's theory of Stalin's state terror as filtering apparatus, but after having served two years in the army, he becomes more and more impressed by the qualities of obedience and strength. He rejects the loose morals of post-Soviet society, which is for him a world of moral decay. The Stalinist empire, in contrast, is seen as the admired lost realm of discipline, wholeness, devotion, and brutal grandeur. It is clear that his feelings towards past and present are a mixture of shame for the generation before him responsible for the post-Soviet state and nostalgia for the Stalinist empire. Boris Nordebos' conclusion about this novel is that it contains conflicting visions. I quote, the empire as a traumatic historical experience and the empire as venerable and restorable manifestation of Russia's mission and identity, end of quote. These conflicting visions can now be explained as the result of the two affects that are predominant in the second or younger generations, and those of shame and nostalgia. An example of a different order is Andrei Zhraginshev's uh, film The Return from 2003. Through the rather simple narrative of two sons and the return of their father, this film represents allegorically 
uh, the intergenerational dynamic between the first generation survivors or executioners of the Gulag and the second generation of their children, taken as a group or literally as their real children. The relation to Stalinism and the Gulag in this film is never made explicit on the level of the plot uh, uh, of a crisis within a family there are no connections established to this past of Russia. It is only on an allegorical level that this family narrative can be read as a narrative about the dynamic between generations after the Gulag. This film has been praised for the many different levels on which it can be read. According to the most literal uh, reading, it is a chronicle of two children who record with the help of a logbook the events of a trip with their father who has returned after an absence of 12 years. This trip functions then as their transformation from childhood to manhood, in other words, as a rite de passage. At yet another level, the film is read in religious terms. The father is in a kind of Christ coming to the world to help the world. Problem of such religious interpretations is that they can only read isolated scenes or motifs but are not able to provide an encompassing reading of the film as a whole. More interestingly, the film has also been read uh, politically. The father figure represents then the strong communist Soviet Union and the death of that state. I quote, the two sons can be interpreted as one representing the section that accepted subjugation by the state and the other that rebelled against the state and demanded freedom and democracy. Today, both kinds of former uh, Soviet citizens yearn, uh, yearn for the fatherland of the past for different reasons." End of quote. I will elaborate this political reading by probing the psychological dynamic between father and sons. Through such a reading of the psychological ramifications of a political reading, the dynamic between the first and second generation after Stalinism and the Gulag can be understood more clearly. The film begins with an underwater scene. The wreck of an old wooden boat can be recognized on the bottom of the sea. In the next scene, we see young boys jumping from a high structure into the sea. We assume that the boys jump into the water uh, that we already saw from below. At the very end of the film, we have to reconsider this reading. It is at the end that the dead father sinks to the bottom of the sea with the leaking boat on which he had been laid down by his two sons. This has significant implications. The film is not playing in an abstract, unidentified present tense. The film that follows uh, the first underwater scene is a long flashback. It is all set in a time long past. In the beginning of the film, two brothers, Andre, the oldest, and Ivan, um, come home after they have been playing with some other boys. The mother says, father is sleeping. Who, they ask? Father, go and look for a second, responds the mother. The two boys uh, are clearly flabbergasted because it turns out that the father has returned after 12 years of absence. They peek into the bedroom and Ivan, the youngest, immediately leaves and goes looking for an old book with mythological or religious prints in which an old photograph of the whole family is hidden. The mother, the father, the two sons, but many years younger. Ivan cannot accept that this man is his father. He needs proof because he mistrusts this man who has returned after such a long time. One of the major reasons for this suspicion is that nobody is able or willing to specify from what or where the father has returned. This suspicion of the youngest son is made explicit in the conversation the two boys have in bed later this evening. Uh, let's see, yeah. Andre, have you seen him? What a bear, he certainly practices a fight sport, certainly. But where does he come from? Just like that, he has returned. Are you not happy? Uh, oh yes, but Mama once said that he was a pilot, but he does not look like a pilot. He, uh, he's on vacation, then he does not have to wear a uniform. Ivan is not yet convinced. His answer is maybe, in contrast with his older brother. 
Ivan is not able to identify with this man who claims to be his father. In all respects, he keeps him at a distance. This becomes very outspoken the next day after the three of them have left by car for a two days fishing trip. Ivan, who sits in the back of the car, is addressed by his father by his name. And I will show you now uh, this clip. Yeah. Папа. Что? Что, папа? Почему ты не говоришь так? Что, папа? Вот уже лучше. Так почему? Стесняешься называть отцом своего отца? Нет. Не ври мне. Я не вру. Называй меня отцом, как положено сыну. Понял? Да, папа. Молодец, сынок. Although Ivan finally speaks with two words and addresses his father with father, in the rest of the film he again refuses to do so. During this conversation between father and son, the father watches his son f uh, via the rear view mirror and vice versa. There is no direct exchange of looks. This scene makes clear that it is not only suspicion that makes it impossible for Ivan to address his father as father. Whereas the father uses all the time uh, diminutives like little son, our little one, to express his affection towards his youngest son, Ivan is not able to return these signs of affection because he feels shame towards his father. He refrains from facing his father directly. He looks away or looks at him via the rear view mirror. Although the suspicion and shame of Ivan does not seem to be shared by his brother, André, the oldest uh, son, uh, the oldest son also does not seem to be impressed by the occasionally very authoritarian behavior of his father. When he has been forced to leave the car in order to look for a place where they can have lunch, he stays away for three hours. Although he had found a restaurant very quickly, he just wanted to look around. He is punished verbally for it by his father. Although he accepts the man as his father, he does not seem to have much respect for his authority. When the father has caught a, uh, a young man who has stolen his wallet, André refuses to take revenge on this young man when the father demands him to do so. The authoritarian homosocial system of competition, punishment and revenge is wasted on both sons. The distance between the father and his two sons is most acutely felt by the youngest. He creates distance not only through his suspicion and shame, but also through heavy irony. When the father asks his son to take the bus back home because he, is suddenly, uh, he has suddenly something else to do, Ivan is seriously resentful. Uh, but you had promised um, us a trip later. Yes, over 12 years. What did you say? I said that you will take us to the waterfall another time, over 12 years. Did I say something wrong? And then he walks away from his father, not waiting for an answer. After the two brothers have settled in the bus to take them home, the father reconsiders his plan and he takes them to a small deserted island before the coast. That night, the two brothers have the following conversation after they had dinner with their father. During that dinner, the father refuses to eat the fish the sons had caught with the argument that once somewhere far away from here, he had eaten too much of it. And I will again show 
that plan. Something goes wrong now. Не знаю, может на севере. Let's see. Видал, как умол, когда ты его спросил, где это было. А почему? Yeah, the sound is okay, but not the image. Uh, yeah, we'll just play. Yeah. Не расстилаешься. Кто расстилается? Ты расстилаешься. Папа ту, папа сю. Как он взрослый. А мало ли взрослых. Любому слову его веришь. В рот заглядываешь. А он неизвестно кто. Может бандит. Возьму ты прирежет нас в лесу. И что? Че слышал? Ну и дури ты мелкий. Посмотрим, кто дурень, когда он ножом встанется. Смейся, смейся. Ты чё? У, сейчас кто-то будет резать глупого Ивана. Что ты делаешь? Да перестань. Сейчас кого-то зарежу. Перестань, иди нафиг. Отстань, отстань, отстань. Пусти. Сдаешься? Отпусти. Сдаешься? Ты чё, не понимаешь, что ли, мы здесь одни? А кто он такой? Откуда мне знать, что он отец? Что ты ему веришь-то? Дурак. Мама сказала, он отец. Отец, понял? Дурак. Мелкий. Вай. Ты чего плачешь, что ли? Отстань. Ты чего она придумал здесь огорнутый? Я хочу домой. Слушай, давай я завтра на рыбалку пойдем. Рано утро, пока он спать будет. Представляешь, какой клюк будет? Ва. Пошли, Ва. Пошли. Спи тогда. Что это? Дневник. Твоя сейчас очередь. Давай завтра, Вань. Поздно уже. Фонарики. Ivan, the little one, uh, expresses his suspicion, mingled with shame and anger, to his older brother. The next day, he has a confrontation with his father, and after the father has first left him in the middle uh, of nowhere, um, when Ivan complains about the fact that they have left an excellent fishing spot. When the father returns to pick him up after it has started to rain, the father begins the conversation with a remark filled with irony. Did they bite? Uh, put dry clothes on. Why have you come? Why? Why did you take us with you? Why is it that you uh, uh, care for us? 
It all went okay without you, with mama and grandmother. Why have you come? Why did you take us with you? Do you really care for us? Give me an answer. And then the father, mother asked me so. Yes, mama has asked you to do it, but you, you yourself. I also wanted it. Why? To bully us, put dry clothes on. The past of the father is never disclosed. At a certain moment, the father leaves the two boys on uh, their own in order to look for something on the deserted island. In a ruined house, he excavates an old chest. After opening the chest, uh, there turns out to be a smaller box in it. He doesn't open this box, but takes it with him and hides it in the boat. After he has died by falling from the watchtower, his two sons take his body to the boats to bring it home. After arrival at the main land, the boat with father and his secret box drives away and sinks to the bottom of the sea. The little box stands symbolically for the unknown past of the father, but the box is never opened and the two sons even do not know of its existence. The father takes it uh, with him to the bottom of the sea. At significant moments in the film, it is suggested that Ivan suffers from fear of failure. In the beginning, just after the uh, opening scene, he does not dare to jump off the elevated structure into the sea. Later on, on the uh, desert, deserted island, he has to clean the plates in the sea, but he lets his father's plate sink in the sea. When he tells his father, he proposes Ivan to learn him to make a new one of birch wood. Ivan's answer is, I won't succeed. After the father's death, uh, son Andre adopts the authority of the father and orders his young brother to pull the father to the beach. Ivan's answer is again, I won't succeed. The ultimate scene in the film is when, after another outburst, Ivan runs away to the watchtower. Earlier, he did not dare to climb the watchtower because of vertigo. But now he climbs it, overcoming his vertigo. At the top, out of reach of his father, after he has closed the hatch, it looks as if he is going to jump from the tower. Is he trying a second time to jump from the tower because he has failed to do that at the beginning of the film with the other boys? Or is he trying to commit suicide, or one through the other? His death is then at the same time his overcoming of his fear of failure. This ambiguity cannot be resolved, but it is suggested that his fear of failure is the result of not having a convincing father as a role model. The moment he returns, he refuses him as father, but nevertheless, the return seems to have helped him to overcome his fear of failure. Let's now come to a conclusion. With the examples of the novel Justification by Bikov and uh, Andrei Zhragintia's film The Return, I've tried to show how the dynamic between first and gen second generation survivors of the Gulag differs radically from the kind of dynamic at stake between survivors of the Holocaust and the generations after them. This dynamic is not determined by mourning and by identification of later generations with the first generation. The later generations relate uh, rather with shame and suspicion to the first generation, and generations after the second one even look back with nostalgia to the Soviet empire of which their earlier generations were the victims. This dynamic is much more complex than the generational dynamic after the Holocaust. It exp expresses itself indirectly, not through direct historical genres like testimonies or memoirs, but more indirectly through imaginative genres in which ghosts or zombies figure as the return of a past that has not been worked through. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for your really impressive uh, lecture. Uh, uh, I think we should uh, begin with, uh, with the discussion. Yes, please. Uh, um, thank you for your talk. Um, given all these differences that you have noticed at the historical level and also like when you compare, you know, first and second generation memories, do you think that maybe it would be more f interesting to compare the this kind of all this remembering of the gulag or what well, exactly it wasn't very clear what you understand by gulag but 
let's say, just the Gulag, um, with, let's say, other, other experiences of forced labor, of radical industri industrialization, like people being uprooted and moved to work camps or to work in certain places. I mean, could you, for example, compare second generation memoirs with, uh, let's say, the children of the people who worked in uh, the slaughter, Eastern European migrants who worked in the slaughterhouses in Chicago? Maybe it would be more interesting. Or I don't know, uh, work camps uh, within the, produced by the colonial regime in the 19th and 20th century. No, I'm not, I don't think that that would make sense. Um, the, the slaughterhouses in Chicago, I don't know exactly why that would be an interesting uh, e uh, situation or event to compare uh, this with. And what I have been focusing on, why it is so important to compare, uh, or why it is, I think, possible and also urgent to compare uh, the Holocaust with the Gulag, uh, is because of, in a way, the kind of dynamics between the generations who came after. So I'm not so much, although there I have also been beginning, uh, I, I began with my argument uh, following also Alexander Atkins with just uh, comparing the events themselves. My main uh, focus is not on the events itself, the Holocaust versus the Gulag, or Nazism versus uh, Stalinism, but ultimately I, what I was comparing is uh, the dynamics between you know, the generations uh, after the Holocaust and after the Gulag. And I think to, to, then to talk about uh, slaughterhouses in Chicago, I think that does not result in a very specific dynamics uh, between the generations after. So, yeah. Thank you for your talk a lot. Uh, in the beginning of your speech, you made few references about uh, how nostalgia is connected to the shame, how it's similar. And if it's possible, can you elaborate a bit on the concept of nostalgia if you are talking about traumatic events? Are you, um, do you connect it more to the first generation who actually start, uh, suffered from from that event, traumatic event, which could be Gulag, Holocaust, or any other period, or you're more referring to the second generations, no. and how you understand how nostalgia is even possible in this situation. Thank you. No, I was uh, using the term nostalgia, first of all, on the basis of that uh, novel by Bikov, but that uh, relates especially to the later generations, eh? the, 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 the post-Soviet, uh, uh, generations who, uh, who are, how do you say that, not really happy in, you know, to live in Russia uh, and in this kind of neo-capitalist, uh, post-communist you know, uh, kind of society. And for them, uh, uh, without having lived uh, the, the past of Stalinism, they have, uh, in a way, reasons being unhappy in, uh, in, in a way, the post-Soviet state to uh, be nostalgic for that period of Stalinism they have never been part of. They have, so it is the later generation, not the first generation, who is nostalgic. So second or third, yes. I want, uh, thank you very much for your uh, enlightening uh, lecture and for the uh, analysis of Zwiagince's film, which are admired very much. Um, but my question is, uh, don't you think that your characteristic of Gulag experience is accurate to the, let's say, maybe very big, but to a group of prisoners? because uh, in the terms of shame, because uh, a lot of people um, who were in the Gulag camps 
uh, were not uh, or didn't hate the enemies uh, of the people, but rather they were there because they were simply Estonians, Poles, Tatars, and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, that is one of the, uh, how do you say that, major differences also between Holocaust and Gulag, that this whole group of yeah, victims of the Gulag is extremely diverse. Whereas in the case of the Holocaust, although uh, that is a much more, although it's also diverse, it's much more clear, and uh, not for 100%, but who the victims were, uh, uh, Jews, Romas, Homos and then a, a small group of, uh, let's say, political prisoners and uh, homosexuals. But in the case of the Gulag, also for later generations to understand um, now, yeah, who, who were sent to the Gulag or who were imprisoned in those camps, it is very difficult to understand because the group is so heterogeneous. So there are all kinds, and indeed, also Poland from the, uh, yeah, Poland for instance, and uh, so, but that also makes it very difficult for later generation to understand, to, to now how do you say that, to relate to that uh, first generation of victims, eh, because they cannot really uh, understand what the identity of that whole group was. So, and, and I think that is one of the problems. And of course, when you uh, when it is only about generation of your own family in the familiar context, then perhaps it is possible to understand. But it is this whole group, eh? your own family, your own father, grandfather, mother, or grandmother, uh, be, was part of an enormous group of yeah, gulag uh, victims. But at the same time, that whole category of the gulag victim is too diverse in order to understand that identity. Yes. Here is. Okay. Thank you for your very interesting uh, show, especially of that Zvegintsev uh, film, but I wonder why uh, have you decided on such uh, only male-oriented identity, uh, whether you wouldn't like to include in your argument works of, for instance, Anne Applebaum, who concentrated on Gulag, or Svil uh, Svitlana uh, Alexeyeva, uh, Alexeyevich, uh, a Nobel Prize winning uh, yeah. white Russian author who wrote about exactly about that experience, generational experience between, and he, uh, she added actually even more perspective on multinational nature, not only of the Soviet army, but also of people who were sent to gulags because Soviet Union consisted of many nationalities and during the World War II, they also took over parts of before independent countries like Poland, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, and all those people were part of that in various perspectives because first they were sent to gulags, then sometimes they were joining Soviet army and finally traveling with that army towards Berlin. So, it's a much more complicated perspective. So perpetrators and uh, victims of the uh, of the Gulag's experience, it's a much more mixed category and identity. What do you think about it, especially from the gender perspective? Uh, now of course, in the beginning, in the beginning, I mentioned uh, uh, Ginsburg book, the, and that, but the reason why I ultimately decided to focus on this one film, The Return, is because of its allegorical nature. Uh, of course, my approach would have, could also be uh, different by focusing on a large number of different texts or films or uh, whatever kind of, of or, or testimonies. And then, of course, I should have, uh, how do you say that? Uh, 
but that, that is then an, an, almost a kind of empirical study of an endless number of testimonies, literary text, artworks, and so on. And then the gender element is then extremely important. Then you also have to, now yeah, how do you say that, to acknowledge also the, the, that kind of uh, gender difference. Uh, for me, it was important to focus on this film, The Return, because of its allegorical nature. I'm not claiming that ultimately this kind of dynamics uh, between the generations is, is always a, a dynamics between father and sons. Uh, although in this film, it is the case that it is a dynamic between father and son. For me, it what, what, was what made this allegory between generations so important is not a gendered nature, but how this dynamics is uh, determined by shame and suspicion. So that is the reason why I chose to focus and to give a close reading of one allegorical representation of that kind of, yeah. But of course, the. But then that would uh, it would not be possible to do that in one talk. Then you need a book-length study to, uh, when you uh, to include more examples and also of women. Yeah, that was one question more. What uh, interests me is, uh, do you think that uh, this? Uh, uh, film where that problem between father and uh, son was coming up uh, uh, is a so-called singular event that dynamic uh, because I mean I'm uh, I had been social scientist for a long time and uh, you know uh, uh, if it's a singular event and not empirically a representative event uh, it's a huge difference of course uh, because that euphoria you, uh, which you mentioned, uh, uh, I was a bit shocked uh, because, of course, uh, uh, I didn't really think that the second or third generation uh, is really uh, uh, upset about uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you said, nearly capitalistic society in Russia uh, in comparison with communistic ideals, etc. Uh, so is it a singular event you, you tried to, to uh, uh, elaborate, or do you think is it a representative event uh, uh, that that second or third generation is really thinking like that? Yeah. Of course, I read it, and I was quite explicit uh, about that, as an allegory. So that ultimately means that it is not singular. And so it is really almost emblematic for a larger phenomenon of uh, so this kind of dynamic between generations then is not only true the case for uh, <laughs> the father and the sons in this film, but no, it characterizes uh, almost a societal phenomenon, yes. But of course, that's a matter of reading. At the same time, I also referred to other readings of this film, religious ones, and also just nah, the, those which take it as just a story about a father and two sons. But there are also political readings of this film, and they also... How do you say that? Uh, although they, they do not mention the term allegory, for them it is also a, a kind of ultimately about this Russian society as such and the dynamics between generations and how it relates to the former Soviet Union. Yeah. Thank you. One question more. Good morning, uh, thank you for your presentation. I have a question related to the type of memory that you are analyzing. As I understood with using shame and suspicion in the transmission of trauma, you are referring to individual memory or what Alpha names the memory within the family cycles. And my question is, can we, do you also see the same mechanism sometime migrating from the individual memory to the collective memory? Or is it something that we can spot only at the individual level of the 
generation transmission within the family, but not within the society, maybe? Uh, yeah, that's difficult to answer. Uh, well, uh, I can best answer that. I once uh, I, I, I developed this argument when I was invited by Memorial in Moscow, eh, this human rights organization in Moscow, or in, and they uh, told me that they had been organizing uh, uh, um, on schools. Uh, that uh, uh, pupils at these highs uh, at schools were asked to uh, interview their grandparents about the Stalinist era, and strangely enough, that whole project that was now in many cities they tried to do this uh, was not a big success because um, how do you say that? Especially the uh, the grandparents or other relatives from that kind of generation who had been part of the Stalinist era did not want to talk about that past. So it is very, so, uh, how do you say, and that in a way is almost uh, confirming my uh, reading of this kind of dynamics that there was no real, how do you say that, possibility of uh, exchanging ideas or experiences of that past with later generations. And also the, the younger generations were not really able to yeah, address their grandparents or other uh, relatives. So I, what that proves, yeah, perhaps the memorial uh, did not really organize this project at high schools in the best way, but I think at this emblematic for the kind of very difficult interaction between uh, the generations uh, at this moment. So yes, I think it, it, it is not an, uh, an individual case, but it is emblematic for the kind of the, the uh, so it is not just happening on a familial level, but it is really uh, characterizing the dynamics between generations as such in Russia. Thank you. Any more questions? Oh, yes. <laughs> really. Please. Um, yeah, just my question came very spontaneous and I'll try to articulate. And I mean what you said about the dial lack of dialogue between generations in case of gulag survivors. I think there's a fundamental aspect of totalitarianism is a silence and inability to talk about violence. And this is the difference from a Holocaust survivors to gulag survivors. That, and it, because exactly as you said in the beginning that the Soviet regime lasted much longer. So all the knowledge was literally, and all the experience about gulag was literally lost. And as the people who came back from, from gulag in order to survive, in order to adopt, in order to start new life, uh, they just ref refused to speak about their experiences. And in many cases, and I can tell it both as, as from personal experience and from my academic experience, that it was just a form of self-protection of not to speak about what happened to the father or grandfather or grandmother and just with complete silence. And from my own research, I know families that one woman was married to a former, uh, to a person who was born in a deportation in Siberia. And uh, she first learned it about the fact, the fact about her spouse, only after the fall of the Soviet Union, when they already had three adult children. I mean, this is alienation in family because you simply do not talk because you think if your children will not know, that your children will be protected, both emotionally and politically. I mean, I'm sorry for I was so emotional and maybe not quite articulated, but thank you very much for your presentation. And it was more more comment than a question. Yeah. No, I think what you say is, is really important, but I, at the same time, I, what I was emphasizing is not so much that the, the first generation, also in the Holocaust, it was often the case that those uh, victims are silent, but especially why were the, uh, it, it, I was in a way interested in the second or third generation, and why did they not ask questions to the first generation of victims? And, um, 
And that, I think, is in the Holocaust very different. Huh? That especially the second or the third generation want to know what happened to uh, their parents, grandparents, or other relatives, and they are asking questions, especially when that first generation is being silent. But in the case of the Gulag, my impression is that also the, this later generation, uh, the, the second or third generation, has difficulty in posing these questions to the earlier uh, generation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, let me mm, f make a s short remark to the end of our uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, I, uh, mm, I wonder a little bit uh, uh, how fruitful it was to compare uh, the relation of uh, Holocaust victims and its children to the uh, victims of Gulag and his and the ne next generation. Uh, uh, f um, I think we should uh, uh, make such comparisons uh, in a broader scala. Uh, it, it, the proper form for comparison uh, uh, between Gulag victims is uh, 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 Gulag victims or Soviet society is a is it in that case German society? And as we know, the uh, uh, working on remembrance in German so society was, uh, in the democratic German society, was not so simple. It take uh, many decades to 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 come to the uh, 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 situation from today. And uh, uh, Professor Ruskevich mentioned. Uh, there are many groups of Gulag victims. There are really many groups. There are the enemy of people <laughs> like Orthodox clergy, like Islamic clergy in the Soviet Union, bourgeoisie, non-communist politicians, and many, many groups that are, that, that, that are not suitable for uh, Atkins criteria. Uh, so, so I uh, understand your brilliant uh, lecture as an um, appeal for us to make great uh, differentiate uh, comparison uh, studies about the memory of, of that totalitarianism, Soviet totalitarianism and, and, and uh, uh, German and Nazi totalitarianism. Thank you very much. Thank you.